Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, just show of hands, like who here is able to deploy into production from code commit to production in like two weeks, one sprint? Anyone? Oh wow, it's actually not bad. I was, uh, I'm, I'm used to a lot worse. <laughs> um, so actually, a quick thing about this talk. So this is. Uh, I collected a whole bunch of my findings from DevOps of how bad it's been, especially in the Toronto market. So I dumped a lot of my retrospectives, a lot of my findings into ChatGPT4 and kind of played around with it and turned it into a talk. And it's, it's been kind of like all my findings from last, I think 15, 20 years I've been using, I still remember when Jenkins was called Hudson and Hudson was the new thing and Hudson replaced CruiseControl.net. I don't know if anyone's used Cruise Control. Uh, so I've been doing like release, I used to do DevOps when it was still called release management. Um, I've been doing this stuff a lot, but I got really frustrated recently working with a couple of companies of seeing how bad it is where, uh, especially in the Toronto market of Java shops, people say they're doing DevOps, they're, they're not. It's, hey, we have Jenkins, we have Kubernetes, and we have some build pipelines, and we have DevOps, but then when you st start digging into it, it's a complete mess. Uh, and it's become this complete tools focus instead of practices. And I will say that like fundamentally from a DevOps point of view, I'll, I'm going to argue that it hasn't really changed. Um, I think one of the best books that I recommend to people is Continuous Delivery. Came out in 2010, tackles all the fundamentals, Nobody seems to be following it, or at least a lot of people aren't following it. Uh, and it's been 13 years, which in um, uh, software development is, is a long time. Um, and it's also this confusion where it's like, I feel this DevOps has just become this tool that means tech. It means I have Jenkins, I have containers, I have microservices, I have CI, CD pipelines. That, that's what it means. Uh, it has nothing to do with tools. It's really about ownership and going faster. There's, there's a couple of metrics that I use. I don't know, has anyone heard of the four uh, Dora metrics? So those are, there's like four kind of core devops metrics that Je, uh, I think Jez Humble also talked about. One of them is like, how long does it take you to get um, from code commit to production? Uh, two weeks is kind of good, but I still see six months or a year. Uh, it's, it's still really bad. Um, has anyone here heard of Plato's allegory of the cave? Uh, I related it to what I see in DevOps and it's this fable from like 2000 years ago where uh, there was a guy just sitting in the cave and all his entire reality was just seeing shadows and he thought reality was the shadows. And then one day he escaped and he learned that the shadows were fake. And then he was trying to explain this new reality to people that were still stuck in the cave and he couldn't. Like people push back on some of these concepts. And I, I wouldn't even say these are new concepts in DevOps, but just the amount of like pushback that I get from some of these, like, and these aren't even my ideas. These have been around for the last 15 years, but I bring them up and people think I'm insane, especially like businesses. They're like, this is silly. Why would you do this? The amount of pushback on some of these things. And I guarantee you somebody's gonna call me out on some of these items. Um, but I want you guys to kind of approach things openly instead of <laughs> just thinking I'm a whack job. Um, what's possible, what I've seen like in successful organizations, and this is for like high volume mission critical enterprise applications. Um, I've seen every sprint you deploy to production, like two weeks. Yeah. At the end of the sprint, you deploy into production. That's it. Uh, counterintuitively for some reason, some people in business still think it's insane deploying during peak business hours. Does anyone think that's insane? No. Okay. I've, I've gotten uh, called insane for saying that. Uh, developers owning everything, including production where they press the button. Actually, I've had like PMs press the button. I'm like, yeah, the button's safe. Just press the button. You could deploy. Uh, people used to think that's safe. Um, and I've seen like in these enterprise, like if these, in these well-run enterprises, 
if you just have a small fix to change, like little small fix where, hey, we need to get this into production, it's just a variable update. If we put it in production um, for this high volume site, you know, we're gonna start making an extra $500 an hour. Like, I think that's possible. Like 15 minutes from I commit to prod and I'm, pr I'm in production, zero downtime. Totally possible. I think wherever you're at, if you wanna get here, I think you need to be open-minded to all these practices. Um, I kind of playing around with these um, through all of my experience. I kind of summarized them to three, three buckets. Uh, first one being Titan feedback. People always relate continuous integration with DevOps. I think it is a staple. Everyone knows that term. Everyone's heard of that term. Nobody, uh, very few people actually apply continuous integration. They think that continuous in integration means once a month, once a week, uh, once every six months. No, it's continuous. It's not every day, it's not every month, it's, it's continuous. You do things as frequently as possible and you integrate things as frequently as possible. And it's the whole uh, shift left. You, you move things, you don't wait. You integrate testing, you integrate security, do everything as quickly as possible. Uh, number two, uh, waste. So really focusing on value, like the amount of waste that I see in DevOps of people just reinventing the wheel, over engineering, a lot of stuff, people default to tools because they think, hey, if I just use tool X, it's cool, everyone uses tool X, but if you don't need tool X, don't use tool X. And then thirdly, and I think this is actually the most important one is like this uh, foster imperfection where it's like not trying to be perfect. I know Facebook had that motto of uh, perfection is the enemy of good. I, I think Zucker Zuckerberg's called it out a few times where counterintuitively allowing failure but doing things more often and being able to recover it is actually, will actually give you better software which doesn't make sense for some people but I, I will uh, stand, stand up for that. Um, so number one, the Titan feedback. And I'm gonna start with probably the two most controversial ones, um, Titan integration. So number one, uh, stop doing feature branching. Uh, who here does feature branching? Everyone? Yeah, just stop doing it. It's trunk-based development. Like if you have a good team, you commit work in progress tools. Um, you, they talk about in the CICD book too, where it's when you're not, when you're branching, and, and I mean long, long live branches, okay, one day is fine, two days okay. Like a quick refactor on the weekend because I'm doing a big massive change is fine, but it's the like multi-week changes are gonna, like the amount of over, you're not gonna be able to refactor because you don't know what other people are doing or they're gonna start making changes or everyone's gonna be afraid of refactoring. Um, merge conflicts, you're gonna get to the point where you have one person becoming the merge conflict resolution guy Often, for some reason, people make the junior guy the merge conflict resolution guy. <laughs> and, then, and then it's a, well, I don't know what this code does, so I'm just gonna like resolve using theirs or resolve using mine and, and just roll a dice and see what happens. Um, so this, this one's huge and I see a lot of pushback on it. It, it. it does take a little bit more skill, I will say that, and I will agree to it, like the, um, even the feature toggling, does everyone know kind of what feature toggling is? Yeah. Um, I don't think for 95% of cases you even need explicit feature toggling. You could just kind of, if you're working on a little API, then you know, commit as you're making work, integrate with the changes, but if it's a half finished API and it's kind of hidden, no one's gonna use it. I know Facebook, uh, they've written a little bit about trunk based development, that's what they follow. And they, um, they're open about like, yeah, we like ship half finished functionality. It's in there somewhere. It's just not exposed. Um, and the other strategy that I like to do is um, do the UI first. So I might have like a services, but nothing touches the services. And then the UI update is the last one. Uh, oh, this is the next controversial one. Uh, who here mandates, who here, does anyone here not mandate pull requests? Anyone? Yeah like not mandate. Does anyone allow people to commit into master? 
or dev, and I don't mean the release branch, I mean like if a branch. Pair, yes. Pardon me? If the work is done as a pair, yes. Oh, okay. Um, I would still disagree with that, but okay, does anyone else besides uh, the allowing pairing? Well, to have the YOLO badge on GitHub. To what? Uh, on GitHub, if you do that, you get a badge, like a YOLO badge. Nice. YOLO. I, I, want, I, want, I want the badge. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that build script like a Jenkins file should live on master and commit it into the branch and then merge the branch like every five minutes doesn't really make sense. So when we work directly on master. Yeah, work out a master. I have a release branch. I'm not saying don't branch. I like to have like a stable release branch. If I need to throw a hot fix in, it's fine. But and I'll explain this this pull request thing. Um, because I've been responsible for code reviews and done like static like uh, analysis of like what happens. Um, there's alternatives. Pair programming is great. I don't like it when it's. I, I feel like most people either do it never or mandate it always. And there's a lot of uh, questionable consulting companies that mandate it 100%. Um, and there's there's a there's a. I have views on that, but I think there's a sweet spot in the middle. And I know like me as I get older. Maybe my CSS isn't as good. My JS is kind of bad, but I'll, I still have, I could still put my ego aside and code with more junior developers and pair program. I'm like, yeah, my JavaScript's pretty horrible. Pair programming is one where, and especially if I call it out in a standup where in the morning I'm like, hey, I, I don't understand this, this piece of functionality. Like, can somebody that knows it code with me so I learn it? Like calling that out. I like doing, I, I call it targeted pull requests. I don't know if there's a proper industry name for it, where if I'm doing the pull request and I know my code is questionable because I don't understand a piece of code or I'm uncertain about an implementation, I'll assign that PR to somebody specific that knows it. It won't be like, oh, like this junior person that just joined a week ago uh, doesn't know anything. I'm, I'm not going to pretend that he's going to add me a... Um, uh, add, add a huge amount of input to that. And I also like to do, when I was a tech lead, I like to do uh, asynchronous reviews. Also, I don't know if there's a better name for this, but let me know. But it's where I would, as a tech lead, let people commit. And then on fr every Friday, I would just go into GitHub and do the diff and see what people are doing. And all these strategies on, and static code analysis, um, from all of my analysis of mandated pull requests, there's a couple of issues. Is number one, I've noticed that people, if you just assign randomly, people feel like, oh, I got a PR, so I have to nitpick about something. And they never focus on the important stuff. It's like, oh, I'm busy, but I have to say something so that I think, so that people know I'm actually doing something. So they not nitpick about silly little inconsequential things. They're just a complete waste of time. And then you have back and forths over whatever, uh, PR tool you have and just not as efficient on pair, pair programming. And number two, it's the, uh, I don't know, if I, if I had a good team and ignore juniors, but if I had a good team and I trusted them, like somebody that's worked in the industry for five, 10 years, I would, I would have trust in them that they would understand what an update to read me like that an update to a readme file does not require a pull request and it's not gonna like cause the code to blow up and just allow people uh, to commit like no risk changes, which still happen a lot. Like why, or like bumping versions. Like I, I like to keep uh, like in Gradle the, the dependency versions up to date. So I'll just bump them. But like having a PR is a complete waste of time and having developers that you don't trust that they understand what a low risk change is, I think there, I would argue that there's something wrong with the team. Uh, the deploys, yeah, tighten deploys, do them as often as possible. I like to like, even like sprint one, sprint zero, just set up auto downtime, sorry, auto zero, auto deploy on commit to trunk, zero downtime, green, blue deploy every single time. Just get that, like it's, it's, uh, it's like eating your own dog food. QAs get the latest version all the time. Uh, you're not taking anyone down. You're testing your deployment pipeline. You're ver validating all the stuff. And also doing, um, uh, yes, stateless apps. So 
so it's easier to redeploy them and easier to scale them, et cetera. Um, this one I still find people don't do, and it's the tightening feedback. Like, like, let me know if something bad has happened, especially to the developers right away, and not just in prod, but anywhere. And the easy solution, like the, the hacky solution, I won't even call it a hack, but from day one, do you have a mechanism in your code that if an unknown exception happens, or like a critical error of like databases down, that you immediately know about it? Like, do you have that? Like before setting up, because I know some companies will have, uh, you know, the higher environments, you might have that, but it goes into service now or uh, Splunk, but developers don't have access to Splunk. But even for dev environments, like let me know if I committed a code, piece of code, it built, it deployed, but it's blowing up with random errors. Like let me know about it right away. And um, the quick and easy one with Spring Boot is you update the logback.xml. Has everyone, has anyone here edited logback.xml file? So it's the config file for um, for logging, and you could say like, if unknown exception, send a message here. I like using like, if I'm just starting Sprint Zero, I will do like, if unknown error, send a Teams message into a Teams channel that said that's broken. Uh, if you want to be really, um, if if you want to see a lot of fun, I love doing like, if if you have a team and there's a third party dependency that's flaky, but every time you go to fix it, like every time you let the PM know that like, oh, you know, your thing is, you test it and then you let the other owner know and then it spins back up and you can never catch them from breaking it. If you want to fix it right away, um, I love putting in, in the logback.xml, like if you have a dependency on a database that's flaky, every time it's down and you get like a database connection issue, like go message that team directly and if they're still not fixing it, go message their PM directly. And if it's still not broken, like still not fixed, like message their boss directly, like every time it happens and they're gonna get frustrated the first time, but very fast, they're gonna resolve it. Um, I've, I've had an issue recently where um, there was one, one source of truth for a third party dependency. And I noticed that the, he, he, he was getting annoyed with the team's messages because he was like, oh, I'm business hours. Like for, I'm, I'm the, the source of truth, like the only point of contact of this, depend, this flaky dependency. And he wouldn't check teams. So it's actually pretty easy to set up uh, just SMS notifications if you know their number. Um, there's, there's an appender for uh, AWS SNS in logback. So it's their queuing. And you just add their phone number. And then you just create a message to auto spam that person of SMS. And bonus points, what I've actually started playing around with is that, so I'd use the, the web, sorry, I'd use the appender, um, I'd, I'd use the appender to SMS or like SNS, SMS or MS Teams. So there's a webhook URL, but I would add another API call to uh, OpenAI to craft like a super unique message, maybe with a joke to spam these people so it gets fixed. So they don't think it's like random. Oh, sorry, so they don't think it's automated. Uh, um, it gets stuff fixed a lot quicker. Right, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tight tight interactions. It's like one of the first things I look at with like really, um, what's, what's the b better, uh, not as, uh, not uh, one of the th first things I look at to see if a company has strong DevOps is how few manual handoffs there are. Like how many times do I like, oh, I take the story and then I move it to the QA and then the QA moves it to the PM and then the PM approves it and then it goes to the release manager and the release manager moves it to the deploy team and the deploy team moves it to the infrastructure team. Um, I've seen places where there's like 50. Oh, and then, then a CR gets created for the deploy and then a CR gets created for the database deploy. Like how many handoffs are there? I seen things where it's, where it's almost zero. It's like you just make the code, you commit it, and developers are responsible for quality. Maybe you have an embedded QA team that has some technical s skills, but getting rid of the manual handoffs and where they aren't possible, it's moving towards APIs, so self-serve self APIs, where I don't want to have to create a ticket to get a VM 
it's really easy with the cloud. I just go into Amazon and I get myself a VN. It, it should be that easy, and that's what you should push for. Anytime there's a ticket, a manual ticket, like it, you know, at least sometimes it's service now, but if it's emails, like if you're manually provisioning stuff over emails, you probably, that's something you need to look into. Um, I kind of put together a couple of tools that have helped me um, and things to look into. So it's the first one's trunk-based development with feature toggling, implicit and explicit. There's tools for feature toggling, but I don't think they're needed 95% of the time. Uh, we talked about pair programming, asynchronous code reviews. I also like mob code reviews. As, like, as a tech lead, if I notice that like one piece of code is for whatever reason people don't understand it and it's a mess, I might just do like a lunch and learn on a Friday, get some pizza, and as a team, kind of code on it together to try to explain it. Um, I found that works, and the last one's tr trust. Have you ever tried that as a, like a mob refactoring? Uh, yeah, I think it, it could be refactoring too. Like it doesn't have to be a user story. It could just be like, all right, guys, here's this really m messy code base. And I, I almost feel like refactoring might work better because you're not like bound to, oh, I have to finish the story. It's like, all right, I have whatever we get in half an hour. Yeah. Um, but I think the biggest one is trust. Um, I was on a project recently where um, like I, I came in relatively senior and there's somebody I was just spending a lot of time updating readmes where the readmes were a mess and it was just the readmes. And they mandated, I think it was double, double PRs plus the tech lead on everything. So it would just add three or four weeks. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't I, I looked like that crazy guy from the cave where it's like, I, I don't understand why, why anyone would think double PRs and the tech lead is required for readme changes. Um, I like to also add, keep things for stability for the CI flow so that it's easier to get feedback. Keep all the build, release, deploy scripts, like everything in Gradle and not like one-off scripts in Jenkins or wherever where it's easier to test or if Jenkins goes down or if I just want to quickly deploy to an environment and like still put permissions on it where you can't accidentally deploy into prod but keep all the scripting in Gradle. Um, does everyone here use Maven wrapper? It, it sounds like such a simple thing, like Maven and Gradle wrapper, where it's like, why would I want this? It just wraps up Gradle and I don't have to install it. But it's actually a pretty nice time saver. And this is the, um, I don't need Gradle and, or Maven installed to run a Maven or Gradle build. And especially if there's CI, I don't have to like, if I have a Jenkins machine and then I upgrade Gradle to get a newer version, I don't have to like top beg my CI CD team, sorry, my DevOps team to go up, update all the agents. They'll always pull the latest version. Just want to add a fun, fun bit of trivia for everyone here. The Maven wrapper was conceived at this jug. Just, just in that room over there. Because so. Gradle had it first? Gradle had it first, yeah. yes. Um, and they weren't going to add it to Maven, but uh, Adib, who's actually coming later, you can talk to him. Uh, he talked, talked one of the Maven engineers into creating it. Oh, it's, it's a time saver. Um, what about this, sorry, what about this um, deploy scripts in Gradle? Yeah, just put them in Gradle. Uh, there's plugins. I mean, so what did I do recently? I did, uh, I had to deploy to Amazon Beanstalk, which the, it's the platform as a service. So just import Beanstalk plugin, and then I get the, it's pretty cool, like deploy prod, deploy QA, and I just have to define it and it works. And if, uh, especially if, if you have your own team hosting DevOps, like, uh, like uh, CI, CD, then things will go down. And you know, may maybe prod is something else, but if I just want to deploy to dev and my Jenkins team is struggling, which they often do, you just deploy into dev directly. And you could test the scripts, right? Like it's, I don't like how people put scripts, like if you create a GitHub Actions, um, for deploying, like you script it out, and it's like 20 steps. Like, what are you going to do? Like, run the GitHub action every single time and wait for the like. Oh, I'm going to do a sample commit and I'm going to do it. And I know there's some workarounds, but I prefer just putting in Gradle so it's versioned. Um, and the Spring Boot action, the other like really easy one to implement. The amount of time that I've seen people waste on uh, 
is this deployed yet? Like, what's deployed? Can you tell me what's deployed? Like, what version of the code is? Um, I will say, like, it doesn't have to be Java, but just anything, like, whatever you deploy in whatever language, can I easily identify and, and, and verify uh, what's deployed and specifically the Git hash, like, right away in the build time? So you don't get, like, all these messages from QA, like, hey, did you deploy this version yet? Like, no, just check if it's there. Um, the custom logback configurations that I mentioned with filtering, so you could add like custom filtering where only like log these messages here, send them to Slack, send them to Teams. Uh, Slack and Teams, the webhooks are super easy to set up. You just go into your Teams channel and you say create, like add app, and it gives you a URL and you just send messages to that URL. Uh, AWS does text notifications. I, I also tell people if anyone's working on front end, People forget that like there's no logging if you have an Angular React JS app by default. And I know you could, like in production you could set up more complicated things, but um, if you're working on SPA, like you'd be surprised how often, especially if you're not using like TypeScript, like type languages, how often your uh, Angular React app will just snap, but you're never going to know about it because it's on the browser side. Um, I also like. Sometimes I like to use get pre-commit hooks if you want extra verification of, I don't want people committing, I don't know, uh, incorrect commit messages. Like if you want that extra check before people commit. I have a question about that. Because I've used those too, but get pre-commit hooks don't come, like when you clone the repo, they're not installed? I forgot how I did it. Okay. I actually That's don't use them as check. much as I do. I, th I think it's easier than people think. I haven't done it in a while. Because when you have a good team, they remember yeah. to check stuff. There's a maven plug you can download, so whenever they run the build, the wallet will yeah. install it. So people don't even uh, realize they're getting installed. Oh, that's good. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Spring Boot config is another one. I've, I've seen, I was on a project recently where they were copying uh, config files. So they had a Spring Boot app, and um, they had different environment settings like the different environment, like properties for every environment. But the way they would deploy them is you'd deploy the app and then your release engineer would go in to the VM and copy the properties that the dev would tell them about. Um, you could just put, you could have like environment specific settings in config. And if you want it runtime, because your build process takes six months, there's a thing called Spring Boot Config Server where you could just kind of host your um, config settings out of a, like a little microservice and it, every time the app boots it'll go get the latest settings but you shouldn't be manually moving properties around. Uh, it, somebody would probably ask me if you deploy so fast how, you, how do you do databases? Uh, you could do something like liquid base. I don't think anyone uses DB deploy anymore. That was the old one. But you could version your schema updates. It's not always perfect but you could version your database schema updates so they, they're automatically applied and you don't have to like, oh no, I have to manually go in and apply like insert table, et cetera. Uh, and then for testing, I like to use um, not require developers to install full blown instances or share databases, just use H, like the, and, and I think Spring Boot defaults to H2. Um, and I found that SQL Server and Oracle databases tend to slow people down if you're starting a new project I would, and you're doing SQL, I would move to the other ones, uh, unless there's something you really need in one of those two. Uh, the second one was this waste, and it, it's really looking at, like if you, if you ever do like a value stream map, or if you look at how much time are you spending on actually creating the features that users want, and how much time are you spending on like non-essential whether or not it's like non-essential required stuff, maybe testing, or completely non-essential, like not required stuff, or like this undifferentiated heavy lifting that AWS calls it. Like how much time are you actually spending on the value add stuff, like making money? And how much time are you just wasting? And I see a lot of people just wasting time. And I'm gonna go over some of them. And I think the first two are gonna, it might be even more controversial than uh, the, the two branching ones that I had, this like reduce containers. Like people think that you need containers and you need Kubernetes and uh, you 
the amount of overhead that it adds, like they're great, they're better than managing VMs. Uh, but I've seen this move where people had fully working platform as a service options where you just give it a jar. I mean, it doesn't have to be PCF, but uh, Amazon Beanstalk, Heroku, literally you just take a jar file and you deploy it and everything's managed. You don't have to work, make sure your container, you have the right container image. You don't have to worry about uh, any Docker files, any Kubernetes files, any pods, nothing. It's just here's a jar file. Ideally, it's stateless and go for it. Um, I've seen a lot of companies shoot themselves in the foot. Actually, this one and the next one, if you, if you just care, careful with the next two, that's 50, like you're 50% there. Like that's how badly I've seen people screw up, especially Kubernetes where people think that like, oh, I'll just we need Kubernetes and we're going to host it, but nobody knows Kubernetes. Uh, I, I think it's better now, but the amount of overhead that it adds, especially if you're doing operations is significant. And it's not to say it's bad, and it's not to say that it's not needed. There, there's definitely use cases, but if, you, if there's an easy way to deploy an app, or if you just have a little Lambda function that you just need to run from time to time, that's fine. They're much easier to deal with. And then the second one is have less microservices. The, the, the industry has gone so crazy I think microservices started getting popularized by like Martin Fowler like 15 years ago because everyone had these big giant monoliths. Okay, like 100 developers working out of the same code base, that's probably bad. But I've seen the shift in like so hard the other way where everything needs to be a microservice. Every function needs to be its own microservice. Now you can't do API versioning. Everything has to have its own DevOps pipeline. You're trying to coordinate different versions. Uh, people will tell you that like, like database stuff, if you want like transactional support, things become super complicated. And I, I've heard people tell me, well, if, you, um, if you're doing microservices, then you don't need to do transactions for like database safety. Like it, you shouldn't worry about it, which is, which is absurd. And I'm not saying don't do microservices. I'm just saying that I've seen, especially in the, in the enterprise, like the swing go way too far the one way. And especially if there's, especially if there's companies that push for um, uh, compute, where it's like, hey, how do we make more money? We host a lot more services. So let's go, like, let's tell everyone that we need microservices for every single function piece of code, because they're gonna pay us a lot more money. Um, that's not true. And I'll say, like, the, the sizing that I like to do for monoliths is just like one, one functional unit, one agile team. Like, I have this app. This is my back end, and that's it. I'm not going to split it up if I don't need to split it up. There's nothing wrong with monoliths. Um, I like to start splitting them up when I have multiple teams working out of the same app. Like 100 developers working out of the same app, you're bound to have issues. Oh, the, this is the next one. Uh, write less tests, like write less automated tests. Where I see people massively tripping up is number one, this, um, this blind faith of like, hey, if I just have 80%, you, I don't know why it's 80%. I, I, feel, like, I feel like some really, t some really smart people got tired of explaining to people that it depends, that there's so many different use cases of when you need tests and don't need tests. And people kept asking them, like, how many tests should I write? That somebody just threw out, threw out a number and said 80%. And that's the industry standard of 80%. Um, I don't know if anyone knows the story. I'd love to hear where that came from. But what I've seen is like it, it get abused so badly that I have written um, was it the, the sonar rules where I go into a test to see if it has any asserts. And you'll find that people just start writing asserts, sorry, writing test with no asserts just to hit the code coverage. Uh, and then number two, um, just stop using Cucumber or like any type of like that BDD style testing. It's always a waste of time. People always say like, oh, but the BAs, it'll be faster because the BAs could write the test. No, the developers get stuck writing these really shitty tests in like this English language. And then they have to write another layer of JUnit to run those tests and nobody wants to manage it. If a test doesn't give you value, if, if there's a negative ROI, just stop writing a test. Um, oh, and the, the do-it-yourself stuff. And what I mean by do-it-yourself is 
you know, you're writing your functionality, but somebody decides that they don't like JUnit. And, and, this, is, and this is a true story because I've had an internal, I've seen internal ORMs, internal unit testing frameworks, internal everything. I've also seen like a fork version of Python for whatever reason, because, um, or, or even like, even the idea of common, common libraries, like when you have an internal common library, where, hey, look, I'm, I'm adding you all this cool functionality, like, I am gonna, I could say with 99% certainty, that if it's just like a common generic thing and it's not business specific, I would say with 99% certainty that there's a better, if cheaper open source solution out there and like stop writing, nobody wants your code. You're not, oh, and then you're not gonna put documentation on it. You're not gonna maintain it. Just stop writing common, common libraries. Um, the optimization one is the next one, is the, just the amount of time that I've seen people just squeeze out CPU performance out of like, I need to make things like uh, asynchronous and reactive and non-blocking. And then you ask them like, how much volume is the, the site getting? And they'll tell you, oh, we get like 10 transactions a month. So like, it just, it's just a waste of time. Like you're not doing Netflix scale traffic, um, especially with like the advanced, uh, like the Java threading and synchronization constructs it's so easy to screw up and so hard to catch once like it some of the threading when people start using some of the advanced threading concepts and you don't understand um like what happens when you get the uh thread locks like they, they don't understand synchronization they're just like oh we need non-blocking we need threads they start doing all the stuff, then they leave the company or they get fired because they write bad code. And then debugging this stuff like brings me back memories because it's so hard to debug. Like it, it reminds me of like debugging um, pointer issues in like C where it's, it's just one day it works. And then the next day you go and test it and it doesn't work. And then 99% of the time you don't need it. Maybe 95. Um, the next one, this, this pipeline stuff where people feel like they need these super complicated pipelines and all the code needs to be in there and I need to write all these giant Ansible scripts and put them in Jenkins and then I don't need all this functionality. Like all these modern GitHub actions especially, like a lot of this functionality is baked in. Like any custom scripts, do it in Gradle or Maven or whatever. Just call it from your CI CD pipeline it's easier to test. Uh, you always have a failover if Jenkins is down and it's easier to debug. Oh, uh, this is another one. I like uh, just log less. Um, people, I, th I think one of, one of my other pet peeves is like the, ins the entering method, ent exiting method, logging on everything, uh, completely unstructured. And then you have like, especially if you're using tools like Splunk and you have some traffic to your website, like you can very quickly like hit capacity issues and things get hard and you don't need to log as much as people think. If you're gonna log, and I, I, I do like to log for like exceptional cases, like log if something blows up, include the trace IDs. There's like a Spring Boot Sleuth library will, will give you a little trace ID if things blow up. Um, what I see companies like Netflix doing at scale um, is use metrics and there's some subtle differences but they scale uh, linearly where like the more data you throw it's sorry the more traffic you have it's always relatively the same amount of um, uh, input going into like the, the metrics engine uh, but, but I know that's kind of what um, Netflix does where they try to only do logging for exceptional cases but for like keeping track of how many times things get called, um, what gets called, et cetera, they use metrics. Um, I like to just use tools that don't have, like th there's certain tools you could use that will completely eliminate certain errors. Uh, if you never wanna have like a null pointer exception again, then use something like Kotlin, um, which I kind of advocate for. But I know some people don't want to stick on Java. If you want to, like, I don't know if anyone's here been 
had to deal with a production issue where like a website blew up and then you get on a call and somebody's like, oh, just reset the VM because it crashed. Like you shouldn't be doing that. Like you should just use something that self heals. Like if things will blow up, but like use tools that eliminate entire classes of problems. Uh, and I know TypeScript, if you're doing any JavaScript, stop doing JavaScript, just use TypeScript. Um, and, and generally just see every piece of code, every component is a liability. I know um, Elon Musk and like the reason why, he talks about a lot with his first principles approach to uh, SpaceX, where he's like aggressively looking at like, what can I cut, what can I cut in the process and the build, everything. Uh, even, I think he, he says, if from time to time you cut too much, that's good. Like you should, you should even be free to like, all right, maybe we'll remove this. Okay, like we actually needed that. Let's put it back in. Um, and then tools, uh, like platform as a service or like serverless. I like deploying or like anything serverless where I don't have to manage as much stuff and I don't have to like worry about less management. Uh, being Heroku kind of popularized platform as a service. All the three public clouds have platform as a service. Uh, don't use cu cucumber tests. If you want to make tests more readable, then I love using, um, it's called parameterized tests, and you could like feed it a text file, where with, um, with JUnit, you kind of have a table or a CSV file of your test cases and parameter, like that your BA would, would work on, and then JUnit would take that and run it as a parameterized test. Um, and Spock, I don't know if anyone's used the Spock testing framework, it's it's kind of like Junior except Groovy based, but like much more legible. Like I find it it gets really close to like BDD style tools. If your developers are getting null pointer safety errors, just use Kotlin. Um, if you're doing any type of JavaScript, just use TypeScript. Um, one thing that I started doing because of the overhead of um, of requiring ops. To create, like, I, does anyone here use Splunk for uh, logging? Yeah. I used to have this overhead where, like, I'd have to, like, manage, like, tell the ops guys to install the Splunk agent on the machine, and then they got to control it, but they wouldn't give me access to it, and I'd have to change it. Like, I, I like just owning the Splunk component, and you can just add the, there's a Slack, sorry, there's a Splunk logging appender, so you don't need the agent, so you just put it in your app, and it logs. And it does all the like exactly the same thing as the engine as the agent. It's just part of the app, uh, and I find that speeds things up. I've generally moved away from Jenkins. I do find it's kind of clunky. Does, does anyone disagree with me? No. And this is like I, I've I've worked I've written plugins for Hudson and Jenkins, but like there's a lot of stuff that GitHub Actions gives you that just makes the feedback a little bit quicker. There, there is. We haven't been on Jenkins for like five years now, but there's one thing we've missed is the uh, test statistics, things around how long mm. tests take. I think there's plugins for that. I swear I've used Get plugins. That, like, oh, you export the file. Oh, uh, yeah. Some things aren't as easy. Y yeah. <laughs> oh, that's true, yes. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, I've started, like, with... If I have more volume, I, I've seen Splunk become a bottleneck. It gets kind of expensive. Like I've seen places where you get like 50 gigs of ingestion a day and it's pretty easy to or overwhelm it. And then when you want to query the data, like just let me know what the traffic is. Like I, I've gotten really advanced where I don't just check if a website is down, but I want to see if like maybe my web traffic for whatever reason is like cut in half, uh, but it's not something you could easily check normally. But there's something I would check. Um, and I know Splunk, you could do advanced querying. It's a little bit intensive. But for these type of metrics, any type of numerical data, like micrometer, and there's, there's numerous, I know there's a free, I, I think there's like 15 things you could send micrometer data to. And the, I, ex, I explain micrometer as like the log for J for metrics. That's kind of what it is just that scale, like, and, and metrics scales vertically. No matter how much metrics you throw it, there's going to be the same amount of data coming out. 
Um, the, the Uber jars thing where I like to, I mean, like it's, I, f I think it's a really good best practice to, to write, to create your build once and use it through all the environments and also include all the dependencies inside and not do this thing that Node.js people do sometimes where you deploy, you don't deploy the package, you deploy the code to somewhere and then it does the build. I've seen that flake out a couple of times. I know there's an issue, especially if you have internal libraries, things might flake out, but I know there was an issue with, um, with I've seen it with Java too, but there's a big issue. It was in the news, like I was like 10 years ago, where somebody had this really common tool that everyone was using in Node.js. And one day he just decided to take it off the internet. So you had all these, left path, yeah. yeah, left path. Yeah. So you had all these apps that were in production, maybe they were scaling up, maybe they were rebuilding, but every time they rebuilt, they had to go get that left path library and then the builds broke. Um, and you, I'll say you don't, you don't need microservices to scale. You could scale your monoliths, your, your right size monoliths. Um, and then to make things faster, for whatever reason, people think that when I have a front end, when I have a little app and it has an Angular component and a Java component, I need to deploy those separately. Like, no, just stick them together. Put them in the, uh, I forgot what f file it is, resources or whatever. Wire up all the, the Gradle stuff. It's easier with Gradle. And just deploy one thing. Um, oh, and then avoid WebFlex, especially now with all the new uh, Java stuff. Like the, it's, it's so WebFlex is this new like async five-year-old thing that I think all of Spring Boot moved to, like most of Spring Boot. They rewrote everything to make things asynchronous uh, instead of the old MVC way. Super hard to debug. I've never actually seen metrics except in super edge cases where it's faster. And now with Java 20, 19, 21, all that's going away because there's a better version in Java. Um, but the amount of overhead that I've seen this WebFlex thing that nobody, I think, it, I think it was more of a thing of there's this new way that came out of doing things, but nobody could explain the value, but it was just a cool thing and everyone was doing it. And then I had to deal with a lot of fixing it and debugging it and it was a big giant pain, but everyone wanted it and now I'm really frustrated with it and I'm glad it's going away. Um, and then the last one would be, I like including the Spring Cloud Sleuth library because it adds the, the trace IDs. So you kind of, if you have microservices calling each other, uh, it's easier to see what called what. Um, and I think this is, the, this is the most important one, this last section. It's, it's this counterintuitive thing of like allowing failure. If you have like an enterprise level app, then people think that the way to have safety and reliability is to have 50 sign-offs, like 50 sign-offs and 50 people have to approve it manually and 50 people have to retest it manually. And you, you need 150% test coverage and then another 150% test coverage, like things are gonna be perfect. Like you can't make things perfect. And instead of trying to make things perfect, you counterintuitively just go faster, automate things and break things more faster, which will actually make things uh, have higher quality. Uh, but it's also being open to uh, experimentation, trial and error. Um, the, the other one that I see a lot of companies miss is like allowing for failure. Um, there's such a push in some companies where like you're not allowed to fail and then if you fail, if there's like a production issue, like you wanna like, people will even like pretend nothing bad happened and not say it. Or if, if there's bad code, but you, you don't want to like annoy the PM or the owner, you just kind of like, yeah, everything's great, everything's great. And you say everything's great till the very end and then you push into production and everything blows up. But it is having this, this culture of like, you see failure, like, yeah, if, if you, I, like, I've, like who's taking down production? I've taken down production. Like, yeah, everyone. I've taken down production. Like, it's a lesson learned. It's like, all right, I took it down. Sorry. Like, here's some cool little script that I added that makes sure that this isn't going to happen again. Done. There's no finger pointing. Um, Fun fact, foster failure in animal rescue means fostering animals and then adopting them. 
Yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, moving away from the, the failures and like even rollbacks, like I, I find when you try to strive for perfection, you'll still have outages, but when you have an outage, it's brutal because things are manual and you could have like a six hour outage window. But instead, try to catch issues as quickly as possible and have like rollback mechanisms. Um, especially if you do blue green deploys, that's where you deploy to one, uh, deploy to one thing that's not live and then turn off the traffic from the thing that's live and then go to the not live one. But if you want to roll back quickly, just hold on to the other one, especially like for the first hour, just hold on to it. And if something bad happens, just route the traffic back. Like it's, it's like a five, 10 second rollback. Um, but also, so like, it, and it's, it's two things. It's being able to detect things right away. And you'd be surprised how often people in production don't know that something's broken until like custom, angry customers start calling them um, and the being able to recover quicker. That one's trickier. Yeah. There's no easy way. Because obviously, if you do a delete table, you can't <laughs> undelete table. I've seen things done different ways. There's no perfect solution. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the best way that I've seen it. Where you have to know a little bit what you're doing and how DDLs work and which ones are like destructive, but the allowing the rollback and crafting things in such a way that you're never destructive. There's, um, a, there's a book called Database Refactoring yeah. that has recipes for every single one of those types of changes. Oh, that's an old book. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I know what you're and talking about. You don't even have to buy it. Not only because you can get it at the library for free, but uh, there's also the, the author of the book uh, from Red Hat gave a talk. And wasn't, he at, wasn't he at ThoughtWorks? He was at Red Hat at the time. Oh. Uh, but anyway, the, yeah, the talk's on YouTube. But it's, but it's doable. Like, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, a common thing that you still see is like, oh, I'm deploying to production, so I'm going to have like a CR for the deploy, and it's not going to be the dev, and then I have another CR for the config changes with somebody manually goes into like a virtual desktop, uh, so remote desktop, copies, falls over, and then a DBA always does these changes, like just, just automate them. Um, and this one, the psychological safety, I think this is one of the most important ones. Um, it's, the, it's, it's the being able to say anything you want. And it, it sounds like it's not important, but I've started like realizing that even all the other stuff isn't as important. It's this stuff because you could come to a client and like make a use case for all the stuff. Like, yeah, we can make production super quick, all the stuff, but you'll get pushback because of like number one authority bias. Maybe if like your boss will just, I'm the boss, do as I say. Uh, I feel like very frequently there's these things called sacred cows where we're just not allowed to talk about it. We, we know it's bad, but we're not allowed to talk about it. Um, and the thing that I've kind of learned that makes bad leaders is when a leader tells you, you ask them, they're like, hey, why do we, why do we do X? And they, they just say, because I said so. And I think it actually applies to parenting as well. But um, if you have a leader saying that, like, I would have my views on them. Um, and also, like, less strong is the because that's the way we've always done it. Um, I don't like that one either. And I've started using when the what I've noticed that when like the psychological safety is really bad, like where people aren't open to express some of the stuff. And this is why I think most retros. Um, I have this view on retros that 95% of them are a waste of time, and there's a way to do them right. I find retros are kind of like. PR um, comments where people waste their time on the silly nitpicking 
instead of the important stuff. So I've noticed that if I sense people won't speak freely, I'll tell them that we're going to submit anonymous feedback. And it has to be truly anonymous. It can't be like, you have to log in here, and we're going to note your email. <laughs> but it's anonymous. And I've seen leaders do this. If you tell them, like, look, we're going to do anonymous feedback. Everyone can post to X. It's fully anonymous. And on top of everything, within reason, like it can't be a, 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 like a rant like of like, I hate person X and person X is crazy. <laughs> um, but I will tell them that I will post things raw and unedited as long as it's appropriate, like on a Confluence page internally where everyone can see feedback and that feedback can be acknowledged by everyone. Uh, I've, I've noticed that, that that's become really effective for me. Um, and then I think this is the last one, the Foster's simplification where um, this is like a quote from Elon Musk where it's like being open to do things and take out processes even if you're not sure about it. I've done it in, um, in retros too where at a retro it's like, hey, for two weeks, yeah, like let's, let's get rid of the PR, pro PR process and let's, let's just try it. Like it might not work. Maybe, maybe our developers aren't that good, but let's try it for two weeks and just try it like this, this and, and allowing to tackle tech debt. Um, this is why I love trunk based development so much because having seeing code bases with long lived feature branching versus trunk based development, like it's almost impossible to effectively refactor without screwing people over massively, like massively. Um, and then tools, what I use, uh, I like postmortems. If there's an outage, like let's let's learn from it. Like no finger no finger pointing at all. But what can we do to learn from it? Like if you have an outage, like all right, like why did this happen? Like let's add a script in so it never happens again. Uh, I have a view, like I, I like retrospectives. I just think the traditional way of doing them is poor. Uh, I've started doing like anonymous feedback. I found really useful. I post the feedback with no filtering within reason. Um, I give people for re time for refactoring. I, I find that in some companies, there's this constant push to get features out and develop like tech leads just won't push back of like, all right, like we need to like give us a week to like clean up some stuff and like cut out a thousand lines of code. Yeah, I have a question about that because I think, I think my team is struggling with not enough refactoring right now. Yeah. So how do you find that? Because I, I, I like to track lines of code and, and congratulate people on removing lines of code. Yeah. I had a coworker who, who, Gave me uh, fine. who said he thought that GitHub got their color code backwards for added versus removed lines of code. Because they have added as green and removed as red. But oh, actually, that's pretty good. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, 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 I've had a lot of satisfaction at companies where. Uh, you know, you'd have the PM that like, it, like you, you track lines of code committed. And I've had a lot of satisfaction when non-technical people come to me and they're like, hey, Victor, we don't understand how your productivity is negative a thousand lines of code for this month. They're like, they, they don't understand this. They're like, what do, how can you have negative productivity? Um, Dijkstra said uh, it should be lines of code spent, not lines of yeah. code produced. Yeah. And, and I think, I think it was, I think somebody, I don't know if it was him, but somebody else said that on average, you, you, you're able to comprehend and read the same amount of lines per day. So the less you write, yeah. like the more you, um, and, and I think the last one was like the, I'm sure some people are going to disagree with this stuff. And I'm sure there's in some use cases that the stuff won't work. That's not the point. I'm not saying follow all these, but, but the point is like, like just being able, being open to like, to try them, like even for two weeks, like, all right, like in the next retro, l let's try X for two, three weeks. If it doesn't work in two, three weeks, we stop doing it. It's, it's just this willingness, like how hard people come back on some of these ideas. Just, I, I don't know, like I never knew that, like you would think that software development is like this, this logical thing of people just want value. Like it, the amount of emotion that people attach to some of these things uh, blows my mind. Um, if the, the last one that I like to kind of capture waste 
is in, in pointing out where some of the issues are is like is doing a value stream map is like mapping out the path to production and all of the steps and once you have that data it's easier to to show people that like things are a little bit of inefficient uh oh, we're almost done uh yeah so reviewing 10 feedback reduce waste foster and perfection uh kind of call to action it's just getting away from this tool centric thing. Like it's just value, whatever gives you value. Like I, I try to think of everything I code should either increase value, reduce cost or reduce risk. Those are the three things like, and that's it. If it's not doing one of those things, like then don't do it. Um, the being able to experiment, being able to automate, uh, having trust in developers, making things go faster. I know I added a, an, AI up, an, an AI component to this talk. I did actually use like ChatGPT heavily for this just to collect my thoughts. But I know I, I did a talk on ChatGPT. I won't write things for you. But I find like ChatGPT's ability to like consolidate thoughts it's, is, is amazing. Uh, but if you're stuck with, with DevOps issues, like there's tons of cool little prompts you could do. Uh, reasons to not use Maven prompt. Um, you, and I'll, if uh, who here hasn't used ChatGPT, everyone? Yeah, I highly recommend the Plus version. Uh, I will f fun fact, um, or not fun fact, like f informational fact is that uh, ChatGPT out outputs really nicely in table format. So if I want to compare tools, like compare AWS to Google, you say output in table format. Give me the pros and cons. Give me these columns. Um, that's really nice. Or even like, and it doesn't even have to be one-off questions. Like as a tech lead, my DevOps is complete mess. Here's my three pages of raw dump, like raw information of how crappy our DevOps practices. Just paste it in and just ask it to create a roadmap for you of how to get to the next step. Uh, that works. And that's it. Right on time. <laughs>